The following broadcast is brought to you by the friends and partners of Revival Ministries International. Bibles and go with me now to the book of Judges. I felt the Lord quicken this to me. I shared this several years ago, but you'll understand today the coming together of what God is doing, what's about to happen. And uh, we'll read from chapter 1 and verse 12. And Caleb said, He that smiteth, Kurdish Shepha, and take of it to him I will give Asher my daughter to wife. Amazing how if you conquer, then you get the blessings. You know, David conquered and then he got the blessings. You know, the blessings come to the conqueror, not the loser. And Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it and he gave him Asher, his daughter, to wife. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask her father of a field and she lighted from off her ass and Caleb said to her, what wilt thou? And she said to him, give me a blessing for thou hast given me the south land. Give me also the springs of water. That, and Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. It was say the upper springs and the nether springs. So it would be the upper spring and the lower spring which a lower spring is what you call subterranean water. We live in Florida. The water table is very high. That's why the least amount of rain and water is lying everywhere. But you can't see it when the water seeps away. You don't really know. There's just a couple of feet below. But it's there, subterranean. can't see it. And so then when the rain comes, then you see the two coming together. The upper and the lower come together, and then there's a river. There's a, there's a flood. Now, this thought came to me, really, uh, was not something that originated with me. I was spending some time with Brother Rana Bonka. We were in Africa together at one of his great crusades. And we were sitting back having a meal. Um, in, uh, we were in a remote part of Nigeria. We were sitting around talking, and he was actually just reminiscing about the early days when God called him first to Lesotho as a missionary. He came from Germany, went to Lesotho, and how God launched his ministry. But he said, in the early days, he said, we were always struggling financially. He said it was crazy. And he said, I'd have to pray in just a few pounds, because Lesotho was Bechuana land. It was actually under the British rule. And so they used the pounds, which South Africa was. We only actually got independence in 1961. So everything, they sang God save the queen and or the king, whatever, you know, everything was allegiance to, um, to, uh, to London, you know, as Australia is still to this day, New Zealand, and of course the Commonwealth. At one time, the British Empire spanned the globe. At one time, the sun never set on the Union Jack. And of course, today, it's, it's not that way. But uh, what people don't understand, the lands might be given up, but they still control everything through the money system. So that's another story that I won't get into today. Uh, basically, you know, I'll throw this out. With all the Russian collusion, you know, in our election, and actually it's Britain that's been interfering in our, in our, in our elections. It's got nothing to do with Russia. It's actually coming out of London. So I just thought I'd throw that out for free so that you can, and, you know, somebody say, I don't understand that. You don't understand how the world works. That's why you don't understand that. So... Everything's puppets of a system, but God is dismantling this thing and shaking it and giving the church a last minute reprieve. It is happening. Whatever's hidden is being exposed. It's coming out. Can you say amen? So anyway, we were talking and he said, he was walking along and he was praying. You know, sometimes when you in real struggle, you walk along and you just go out and you really pray. It's amazing how you pray fervently. And when it comes down to provision, Lord, I need your help. If you don't come through, you know, how am I going to pay these things? And he, he was talking to the Lord. He said, are we always going to struggle like this? And he was walking along, and 
there was, I, I believe it was a five-pound note lying in the field, a five-pound note, which actually, this is back, you know, in the 60s, paid his whole rent of his office, you know, five pounds. doesn't sound like a lot now, but back then, you know, it was a lot. And he picked it up, and the Lord said to him, no, no, son, it won't be. The Lord said to him, before I come, you will see the coming together of the two streams, which then the Lord gave him Judges chapter 1. So then I said to him, I said, Brother Ronald, have you ever preached this? He said, no, I never have. I said, then I'm taking it. I'm going to preach this. So this is actually my message now. His thought, but my message, he never has preached it, but I've had the privilege of preaching this around the world. And so anyway, when you understand what God is about to do, so now, the lower springs, what would that represent? That would represent the unseen things that are not visible to the naked eye, which is the anointing. The anointing. There is a river that flows from the throne of God. There's a river. The streams of off shall make glad the city of God. You know, in these meetings, we talk about people drinking, and then people wonder, what are they drinking? I don't see anything to drink. When our church first started in Istanbul 18 years ago, Pastor Kari and Rose went over to Turkey, and Adonik and I were there the first week of January 2000. We flew on, on Y2K. The plane was empty. Adonik and myself, Kirsten, Kelly, and Kenneth, we flew over to Istanbul. I went down with my credit card to a music store downtown Istanbul and bought all the sound system, the microphones, and paid for it. And... Um, but when they started the church, you could not have a church in Turkey, a Christian church. So Pastor Kari said, Pastor, they won't let us have a church. I said, well, what will they let us have? He said, a club. We can have a club. I said, good. Let's call it the River Drinking Club. <laughs> so they formed the River Drinking Club. Then the secret police would come, and they would give a report on the service. They would say, um, it's a club, no doubt. The people are drinking. We don't know what they're drinking, but they were wanted drinking. <laughs> no, really. And there was nothing wrong with it because they couldn't, they couldn't refute that the people were drinking. They just couldn't find what they were drinking. And, and they've been there all those years, you know, the, the River Drinking Club. Now, you think about that. So what, what couldn't they see? They couldn't see what was underneath. Pe many people do not understand the anointing. They don't understand the presence of God. They don't understand that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, that the Holy Spirit is everywhere. Are you with me? He's not manifest everywhere until you get there. But that's why he wants to come and live on the inside of you so that you can go. And the Bible says out of your belly, out of your innermost being will flow forth rivers of living water. So you are containers, you are vessels that carry this, 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 Mortal body, we have this treasure, treasure in earthen vessels, which you think about it, that it's just the grace of God, that God would even come and take us as lowly as what we are, as weak as what we are in this come here, I'm going to pour my blessing into you and then I'm going to use you to go and be a blessing to many. Think about that. It's really mind-blowing when you think about it. So in essence, you can't really claim anything of yourself that you, look what I did, I did this, or what, you didn't do anything. Jesus even said, it's not I that do the work, but my Father within me, he doeth the work. That's why it's imperative that you never take the glory for yourself. But by the same token, don't take the criticism because you can't, not, you can't say, oh, I won't take the glory and then get mad because people criticize you because inadvertently you're taking the glory because you actually think they're attacking you. And so now you have to defend yourself because of what you did when you didn't do it. So did you do it? No, I didn't. He did it. Then why are you trying to defend yourself? If you can give him all the glory, then give him all the criticism as well. All glory go to your name and all criticism go to your wonderful name because he's big enough. God's big enough to handle it all. But you don't see, I mean, it's like walking into a place where they serve tea, you know, great. Who likes tea? You know, all the fine teas and 
which I can drink a cup, but, you know, I grew up drinking tea, but, you know, everybody's like tea, you know, and then you get a whole thing a certain way, you know, a spot of tea, you know, you know how the, they do the whole thing. <laughs> like, the cup is so small, you know. <laughs> um, but if you, let's say the teapot could talk, and you took a microphone and you said to the teapot, hey, tell us about yourself. Well, look at the wonderful tea that I make. Aren't I just something? This, this tea that comes from me. And you want to go, excuse me. You, there's no tea that comes from you. You're just a pot. Somebody else is putting in the water. Somebody else is putting in the leaves. Somebody else is actually making the tea and using you to be the vessel to dispense the tea. Because basically, we can empty you right now and put you on the shelf as an ornament. And you'll never be used for another pot of tea again. So you better stay humble, teapot. So when you remember kids, you learn that thing, I'm a little teapot, pot short and spout, yes, but, you know. So basically, we just teapot, we, we just vessels, we are vessels through which his blessing flows. But many people can't see the blessing, they actually attach it to the person and not understand that God comes and takes his treasure and puts it into earthen vessels. Yes. That's why we need to recognize the anointing when we see it on somebody. And then we have to discern between, okay, so I know them. I know they got, you know, they're just people. They're just people. And I know they got idiosyncrasies and they got you know, quirks and all that kind of stuff. But in all of that, I see the hand of God. Are you with me? So we don't worship them. We worship him. But we see the anointing upon them. And the fact that God will anoint everybody if they will let him, if they will let him. And the anointing is not just for a service so you get touched and hallelujah right around the building. The anointing is for Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. The anointing is for midnight. The anointing is for two o'clock in the morning. The anointing is for when all hell's coming against you, when everything is coming against you, it looks bleak. You have something that's subterranean that you can draw on. Which the scripture says, with joy shall you draw forth water out of the wells of salvation. Yes. How do you get the water out? With joy. With joy. Joy is the bucket that gets the water, the subterranean water out. With joy shall you draw forth water out of the wells of salvation. How many times does the scripture say, rejoice in the Lord? Always. And again, I say rejoice. And then he says, delight yourself in the Lord. In the book of Deuteronomy 28, he said, because you did not serve the Lord with joyfulness and gladness of heart for all the abundance which wish he has blessed you, therefore you will serve your enemies. So God is actually watching over you. The Bible says that he dances over you with joy and singing. God is actually dancing over you. God's the one that says, I know the plans I have for you, say the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. These are the plans I have for you. God's plans are not to destroy you. He's not sitting in heaven thinking what evil he can do to you by Tuesday. But there's someone else doing that. The wicked one. But when you find out who you are in Christ, when you realize that you've been bought with a price, when you realize you don't belong to yourself, when you realize that the blood of Jesus has washed you clean, when you realize he's given you the name that's above every name, that name of Jesus that carries authority in three worlds, in heaven before God, in earth before man, and in hell before the devil and all these demons, when you realize that the scripture declares great is he that's in you than he that's in the world, when you realize that he's raised you up that he wants to use your hands, your feet, your mouthpiece, that you can come and he will take you and use you and send you to the nations of the earth. It's not your power, it's his power. It's not your ability, it's his ability. It's not your strength, it's his strength. And as you're faithful with a little, he makes you rule over much. It comes that multiplication. You start with little, and then God begins to multiply you. We've already talked about the talents, and that we're going to be held responsible for what God has placed in our hand, that we multiplied at the return of the king. And we're going to have to give an account of our life on the day, what we did with our time, our treasure, our tongue, our talents, 
Are you with me? Very important. And as your pastor, it's important that I tell you these things because I want every person that's a member here at the river, when you get to heaven, you're going to get treasure because it'll be terrible. If I stand there, you stand there, and you have no treasure because I didn't preach everything that needed to be preached. I'll, I'll work your blessed assurance, but you're going to get blessed. <laughs> every single one of you is going to get blessed. And you're going to have souls to take with you. You're not going to send the, the people are going to go, the, who are those people? Who is that group of people? Where in the world did they come from? They loaded up. They're getting all the treasure. And they say, oh, that's that river church, that crazy pastor. He taught them they all could walk in the blessing, which I've been told by other preachers, you tell people too much. I've been told by other preachers, preachers in back rooms tell me, you can't tell the people that. You can't tell them they can all walk in blessing and provision and, bless, and God's good. It's not, only, it's not available for everybody. It's only available for a few. I said, that's not what I read in my Bible. That's not what I read in my Bible. So the preacher said, you think everybody can just, I said, if they believe, if they believe, if they believe, everybody. It's almost like they want to make it exclusively for a couple of exclusive people. It's not that way. The gospel's for every single person. All you have to do is believe. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't be educated to come to the place of a greater learning and understanding to now be eligible to receive it. You just have to humble yourself and then receive what God has for you. Well, we don't deserve it. You don't deserve anything. Neither do I. But I'm so happy we don't get what we deserve. Aren't you happy you don't get what you deserve? All these self-righteous, sanctimonious, religious, nose in the air, bigots walk around holier than thou, better than everybody. Meanwhile, they're covered in filthy rags. Filthy rags walk around with their religious underwear <laughs> with skid marks in it. No, I just tell it just like it is. Some of them haven't even changed. They've gone to side two so many times. No, I'll tell it just like it is. Full of it. Strain in a net, swallow a camel. They cross land and sea to make one convert. When they do, they make them twice the devil of hell that they are. They whitewash sepulchres full of dead men's bones. When they open their mouth, all you see is cobwebs. I had somebody private message me on Instagram because they saw that we were associated with another ministry that had been through the ringer, you know. And they were upset. How dare I even associate with those people? I said, well, actually, in fact, you, have you actually sat down with them? No. Have you talked to both of them? No. Do you actually know the story? No. I said, then shut up. <laughs> but they wouldn't stop. They were relentless. You know, I engage people on social media. So I said, I tell you what, Easter's coming up. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to erect a cross in the parking lot. I'll erect two crosses for the couple, and then can you come over and help me? I'll let you nail the nails into them, and you can, you can crucify them. Then she, then she started attacking me. So I said, I'll put a third one up. You can come knock on into me as well. And then they apologized. By the time I had myself there, then they, you know, please, people. All of that is because people actually don't understand the greatness of God and that God would take the foolish things of the world and use the foolish things to confound the wise. And they can't see this subterranean 
river. They can't see the anointing. They don't understand. They judge everything by what they could see, which is the upper spring, which is all the material things, natural things. That's the upper spring. So there's many people focused on the upper, the, 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 you know, the people, houses, cars, lands, building, all that kind of stuff, but they don't see the other side. But what happens when upper and lower come together? You get a flood. You get a flood. And the Lord said to me <clears throat> that there's a flood coming to the body of Christ. I believe it was back 2006, one of the eight-day camp meetings. I preached a whole series, there's a flood coming. I was standing in front of Niagara Falls and I saw the water coming over. Who's ever stood at Niagara Falls? It's amazing. You stand there watching the, wall come, the water come over. And the Lord said, that's what I want to give my church. But they stand with the glass, trying to receive my blessing. And if you stood at the bottom of Niagara Falls with the glass and tried to receive the blessing, you, the glass, and everything would be washed away. And the Lord said to me, the church is not ready for what's coming. But God is repositioning the church and putting the church in a place where we have the mechanisms to receive the blessing, that when the blessing comes, it will not hurt us, it will not harm us, but it will be that which empowers us to carry the gospel to the nations of the earth. Can you say amen? amen. And this is what's called the great end time transfer of wealth. And as I said earlier, that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just, Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children, children, and the wealth of the sin is laid up for the just. Wealth and riches are in the house of the righteous. God's multiplying you. Psalm 112, verse 1 to 3. Praise you the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. And his righteousness endureth forever. Second Corinthians 8 verses 9 and 10. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was so very rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. It's time for the church to possess the upper springs. Are you with me? Because the church has said, you just stay down there by the railroad track in the cabin church and just sing, and you one of those happy clapper roll, holy rollers, but don't come into the town, don't say anything in the courts, don't say anything in the news, leave the news alone, don't say anything in the governments, say nothing in the schools, are you with me? And don't come into the money realm because you don't belong here. You should be walking like a homeless tramp. Uh, Jesus was barefoot, they think he was barefoot with a lamb on his arm speaking Elizabethan English. This is why God spoke to us about kingdom business, which we have kingdom business. How many people are part of kingdom business fellowship that we have here at the church? Every two weeks on Tuesday night, everybody meets over in Studio B. And they'll be up from 80 to 300, depending on what time of the month and what's happening. And people with different businesses and God began to speak to us to believe him that we'd see 100 multimillionaires raise up. Now, they I don't know if they made it out today, but all right. So, and, it's, and here's the thing, it's not just about the money, it's about God positioning you and putting you in a position of dependency upon him to where he prospers you and he multiplies you outside of the system that wants to keep you down. Are you with me? And you know that if the Lord does that, that it'll be the Lord and not you. Are you with me? The purpose is for souls and for finding the end time harvest. You know, in all the years now of ministry from 1980 to the present and traveling to 60 countries of the world, you meet a lot of people. You meet many people with wealth, people with the biggest mansions on the planet. And one of the things you watch of when they get old, for whatever reason, they get sorrowful. Many, I, I very few, unless they were serving God with all their heart, that I find people that were just genuinely happy. Some of them had already blown out their marriages. They weren't even talking to their children. And they were living in this big house all by themselves. The, the big yacht at the dock, they didn't really use anymore. And the list goes on of things. 
the holiday homes in other parts of the world, they maybe got to twice every five years. And you see that it's actually sadness that even though they have all those things, they actually have nothing. That I realized I was richer than all of them put together because of the peace and just the joy and the fact that the Lord was my source. Are you with me? It's a, it's a great revelation to suddenly realize somebody says, yeah, but they had a billion dollars in the bank. Yeah, but they could be dead by tomorrow night. You know what I'm saying? And, and, the, and the fact of the matter that they're not even going to be with the Lord. Some of them, most of them don't even know Jesus because they don't need Jesus. Why would I need Jesus at this time in my life? So why do you think the scripture says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Think about that. How many billionaires or millionaires are in hell today wishing, wishing that they even had a few hours just to come back and make a few changes? And the fact that many sold their soul to the devil because he took them to a high mountain and promised them money, riches, fame, and fortune if they would serve him, and they did. And then he allowed them to access certain realms, and then he came for their soul and took them to a lost eternity. Great sports people with all of the achievements are in hell right now, and no one knows. No one cares. People think you know, we'll, get to, we'll get to hell, we'll throw a party. There ain't no party in hell. There's no party in hell. Oh, yeah, we'll drink and booze and snort. There ain't nothing of that. It's not like that. Hell is a real place. The, the flame is never quenched and the worm does not die. It's a place of torment. You only have one opportunity. It's this side of the grave to make right and make the right decision. It's a point that a man wants to die, after that, the judgment. So my heart breaks for people because I realize that if we don't get the gospel to them, that we allow people to pass our way and we never share Jesus with them. That there are people actually burning in hell today saying, I can't believe they didn't tell me. I can't believe they never told me. I can't believe they, 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 they knew the another way and they never told me. Because the only thing you can take with you when you leave this earth is people. You can't take your house, your property, your investments. You can't. It all stays behind. So if it all stays behind, then what is life really about? Is it about just accumulating wealth and retiring successful? Or is it about attaching what you're doing to what's eternal, which is impacting nations in the kingdom of God? Could God raise up people that would be so blessed that the tithe they were giving to the Lord was so big that they said, you know what, we'll live off the tithe and we'll give God the 90%. Like what happened in the past. J.C. Penney was like that. Colgate was like that. There were many people like that. Somebody said, I just couldn't turn loose of that. Then why should we even ask God to multiply you then? If you made 10,000, could you give God 1,000? Huh? Answer me. Yes. If you made 100,000, could you give God 10? Yes. If you made a million, could you give God 100,000? Yes. If you made 10 million, could you give God a million? Yes. If you made 100 million, could you give God 10 million? Yes. So could you live on 10 million? Yes. Could you give God the 90 million then? Yes. See, well, no, 
I mean, it's easy when you talk the numbers. It's another thing when you get to their place because at that juncture, you now have hired financial advisors who are advising you not to do that. Oh, you need this for your retirement. Meanwhile, they're trying to attach so they can get their fingers on your money and suck your accounts dry because that's how those financial firms make their money. Some little snot-nosed 33-year-old graduate from university suddenly is now the world's leading authority on buying Warren Buffett shares. I told the story this week, a man that had, uh, living in this area, he didn't come to the church, but a businessman, I knew him, and he came to me and said, hey, do you have any advice for me? He said, I have $6 million cash, I don't know where to put it. He said, the banks are only up to certain, this is back 05, 06. He said, the banks are only insured like up to 250, you know, which even then, who insures the FDIC? But that's another story, we won't go, go into any further. But he, he said, I'm going to have to split all my accounts. I have so many accounts, I don't know what to do. I'm going crazy. Do you have a place I can invest the six minutes? I said, well, you could come, underwrite the church mortgage, tell me what interest you want, and I'll make the monthly payment, and your investment will be safe with us. And he looked at me, and he couldn't. He could not, partly because he was afraid that he might do it, and then the Lord would deal with his heart to just pay off the mortgage, which I didn't want him to. I didn't, I was not asking him to do, he asked me, where can I invest that I know my investment is sure and I know my investment is safe, is safe and I can earn an interest. I said, right here, we, we, that will really help us because then it means I can get rid of the banking cabal that is trying to steal my property. And then your money will be safe and our property will be safe. And they were trying to steal. They were trying to steal this property. But we smoked the we smoked it. They tried to steal this place. So he didn't. And then later on I said, hey, did you find out what to do with it? He said, yeah, I've got a financial advisor. He said, buy Warren Buffett shares. He said, I paid about 157000 apiece. Okay, good. I'm happy that your investment's safe. But the crash of 08... He was crying like a stuck pig because Warren Buffett lost 20 billion and, and the shares went down to 78,000. So you work it out, you can work it out. So suddenly your safe investment is not safe anymore because you trusted in Warren Buffett and you never trusted in the kingdom of God. And guess what? We still here all these years later, never missed a payment, never missed one payment. But the financial advisor told him Warren Buffett was safer than us because they don't see the subterranean. They just see us. They don't see God. You don't know who we work for. Our corporate offices are the most amazing corporate offices. Oh, they're not here. This is just a little office I use. Yeah. They're corporate offices of where I work for. Ooh, off the chain. And most people, great, yeah, that's a nice message. Praise God, amen. Now back to reality. No, no, this is the reality. Now the, no, what you see is not the reality. This is the reality. This is the reality. So when God raises up people and the focus is souls and eternity and nations being shaken, suddenly God gives you your purpose because there's only so much ultimately that you can live on. And then the taxes that you have to pay and all of that kind of stuff, which is fine. You Let God set the level of prosperity that you enjoy and say, okay, God, if I could live on a million dollars, I'd be happy. And then I'll give you everything else that comes over. But, oh Lord, I want 10 million and I'll give you everything that comes over. God gives you two, three, four, five hundred million or a billion dollars. Are you with me? But they can't do it. People can't do it because they choke. They choke when it comes to adding more zeros. That's why a lot of people that have wealth, they go form their own foundation. They give to their own foundation and they sit on the foundation. And the money never goes to help anybody. It's a fact. It's a fact, Jack. It's a fact. But I believe it's going to be different in this final hour that God is raising up people that actually have a heart for the kingdom. Because here's the thing. 
if people are Christians and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing with the great wealth that God's entrusted them, they're going to get to heaven. Can you imagine the embarrassing moment where you now have to give an account of your life and what came through your hands and how much went to the kingdom? I met one businessman who's making huge amounts of money. I tell the story, it's pretty amusing. It wasn't at the time, but I was, we were coming out of Teterboro, New Jersey, finished a crusade, trying to get home. Something went wrong with the plane, so it broke. So I'm sitting in the FBO, which is the flight base operation where private planes come out of. And I said, Lord, I have to get home. I've got to get home. I've got one day uh, see Adonic and the kids. This is back. Kelly had already gone on oxygen. And then I've got to have service Sunday and fly immediately Sunday afternoon. I've got to get home. And now the plane's broken. What are we going to do? And a billionaire walked in, and he saw me. Rodney, what are you doing here? I said, well, the plane broke. He said, well, where are you going? I said, Tampa. He said, well, jump on my plane. I'll drop. I'm going to Sarasota, so that's south of Tampa. I'll drop you there, tell your wife to pick up. I thought, hey, great. So we get on this huge intercontinental jet, and I thought, man, this is phenomenal. The Lord's taking me home. I'm being transla translated here. It's just... And it was just him and me and the stewardess and the pilots, and, and they were serving us lobster. And we 39,000 feet over the Carolinas, just, I'm like, whoo, glory to God. Yeah, I'm going home. It's supernatural. I mean, I didn't know I bumped into him there. So we're talking. So he starts to talk to me. I don't ask people questions. It's none of my business. How do you make your money? What do you do? I knew it was in real estate. I knew that the Lord had blessed him. I knew that he'd come from nothing. I knew that he didn't even have a dime. But God taught him how to hear from him, buy the property, sell this property, do this, do that, do this, do that. So everything he did, I knew was from hearing God's voice, which we can teach you to do here. If you just stick around long enough and listen, we can show you how to do that so you can obey him. But anyway, make a long story short. So He's been talking to me, and then he starts to talk and tell me stuff that I didn't even ask for. Like it was almost like there was a curtain, and I was a priest, and he was confessing to me. Yeah. I thought maybe there's, a, there's some kind of a curtain here, and he thinks I'm a priest. But anyway, he starts to tell me, he said, you know, I made 500 million last year. Well, I mean, what do you do when, when somebody tells me? I mean, what do you do? I, I go, wow. Oh. I mean, what do you do? <laughs> Who can even relate to? I made $500 million last year. And then he says to me, I never asked. I never said a word. He said, I gave $5 million to the gospel. Before I knew what I was doing, come out of here. And I looked at him and said, what? What? You gave $5 million? You $45 million short? And that's just on the tide. And then I realized, oh, my God, what have I done? <laughs> he looked at me. I promise you, if there was an ejector seat, he would have pressed the button. I'd have been sucked out of the Challenger, 39,000 feet over the Carolinas. <laughs> I'd have got to heaven, and the Lord would have looked at me and said, you and your big mouth. <laughs> Do you know that? He wouldn't even talk to me again. He put his seat back. He covered his eyes and went to sleep, and I sat like this. But I didn't ask you, you told me. So don't, you know, don't think you're going to tell me and then I'm just going to sit there and be quiet. I thought he was going to say I made 500 million and I gave 200 million to the gospel. But he couldn't. It's too much money. One man said to me, I can't give it to the church. I can't give it to the church. It's too much money. I said, come here. Give me your hand. He said, for what? I said, I'm going to pray that God reduce your income right now to the level of giving that you feel comfortable with. No, no, don't do that. I said, then don't sit here and tell me it's too much. Yeah, then I prayed. I actually asked the Lord, can you tell me why he did that? And the Lord said to me, because he lied on his taxes. He reduced his income on his taxes, so he didn't pay the taxes. That's why he didn't tithe correctly of what should have been tithe. So you, the Bible says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, unto God the things that are God. So because he didn't want to pay his taxes, 
he reported his income. So his income, probably the five million looked that that was what he earned, but he actually earned much more, but he wrote it off in taxes, so it reduced the whole thing. Which, to me, that's just like terrible. It's, getting a tax write-off is one thing, but don't cheat God on his side of the deal just because you've got to write off on the other side. Oh, well, the church just wants all my money. No, there's not. A, you'll see a hundred years from now that this has got nothing to do with the church wanting your money. If you think I want your money, take your money, stick it in your ear. Listen, I know how to get it. I know how to pray and believe God. No, you don't understand. I want your blessing. I don't want anybody to stand before the Lord and be ashamed of that day because there's, hasn't, there's no preacher that even has the balls to stand up and tell you these things from the pulpit. <laughs> Because they're afraid that they're going to offend somebody. You're really going to be offended a hundred years from today. Not only offended, but embarrassed. But not because I didn't tell you the truth. And you come around here, you're going to hear these things. And I know there's some people probably more upset because I mentioned the word balls here today (laughs) than about what's happening. can't believe it. <laughs> Ethel, look here, this guy. Change the channel. Change the channel. God is raising up an army of men and women full of the fire of the Holy Ghost, marching through the land. So let me wrap this up. This always needs wrapping. I decree and declare over this church that God is raising up people with a pure heart and pure motive. I decree and declare that no weapon formed against you will prosper. I decree and declare that everything you put your hand to will prosper. I decree and declare that the devourer is rebuked from everything that pertains to you. That the windows of heaven are open over your life. That poverty and lack is broken far from you. That God is increasing you and multiplying you more and more. And everything we do, we have with eternity in mind. Because every decision we make has an eternal ramification. Everything we own, everything we possess, is, there's an eternal purpose for it. If there's no eternal purpose for it, let it go. It doesn't matter. Preachers are afraid to talk like this because people think, well, they want their money. We don't want your money. We want your blessing. We, we want your blessing and we want you not to be ashamed on the day when you stand before the Lord and have to give an account of what God's blessed you with. I would be embarrassed if you were embarrassed because I didn't have the guts to stand up and tell you the truth. This is an awesome responsibility when it comes to this. And for the people that are not stepping into that realm, you're still going to give an account. Whether you are never, ever a millionaire status, you're still going to give an account. Everybody will give an account of what they had. In proportion to what comes through your life, you're going to give an account. So you might as well give an account for more than give an account for less. Because otherwise you end up being the slothful servant who buries the one talent and never multiplies it for the kingdom. Everything you have is put in your hand to multiply for kingdom purposes. Is God concerned that you, he don't want you to have anything? Absolutely not. You, he'll bless you beyond measure. Everything, your heart's desire, your dream, your, every, every little thing he will do. He will do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think. Let me close with this. Do you understand that if we never grab the hold of this truth, that absolutely not one of us will be sitting here today? That's right. 
And I'm not putting this around my wife and myself, but we could still be back in Africa struggling. And some of the people that I knew from back then are still back in Africa struggling. So it's not, <laughs> you, you have to understand that your breakthrough into what we're talking about here will result in millions of people's lives being touched and changed. Because it's not where you are now, it's where God's going to put you, where the Lord's going to set you. You see, you think I'm looking at you where you are now. I ain't. I know where you're going. If, if you hear the word of the Lord, there's many people here over 21 years of the church that sat here just like you. Today, they're in foreign fields. Today, they're doing major things for God. So I don't look at people the way that maybe you look at them. Well, it's just somebody sitting in the pew. Yeah, but they're not finished yet, and God's putting all the stuff that's needed in them, and then he's going to launch them like one of those rockets and they're going to send them like a missile, and they're going to go to that country, and they're going to go to that city, that town, that village, and they're going to do great things for God. And you don't write them off just because you see that they're sitting there and they're going through some struggles and some battles because God's not finished with them. The Lord's not finished with them. You don't write anybody off. And God's going to, the ones you think God's not going to use, the ones that you've written off, the Lord said, oh, no, they're special vessels. They're chosen for me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use them. I'm going to take them and I'm going to use them just to confound the wise, just to confound the mighty. Is this helping any, everybody here? So the two are going to come together in this final wave, which I believe that we write on this right now. Amen. We're standing on the precipice of this right now. There's too much happening. There's too many words of the Lord. There's too many, there's too many things that have happened for this not to come to pass. This is not about launching something just to make some money. This is about kingdom purpose. This is about God's kingdom purpose. This is about seeing nations shaken by the hand of God. And every one of you are going to be a part of it. Amen. Everyone's going to be a part of it. Amen. See, there are many other churches in Tampa. You can go there, but they're not going to attach eternal purpose to what I'm talking about. Your life, Monday to Saturday, is just your own. Come to church. So you hear the word or whatever. One hour, 90 minutes over, you're back to normal, go out. That's not what the river's about. This is about taking everything that we're doing and attaching an eternal purpose to every single person here. When the Lord told us to start the church, he said, have a place where you prepare the people for eternity. He didn't say have a place where you prepare the people to live an American dream. Big difference. So, in closing, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, it shall come to pass if you hearken and diligently the voice of the Lord your God to observe, to do all his commandments which are commanded this day. The Lord thy God will set thee high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you. If thou hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shalt thou be thy basket and thy saw. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in the storehouses, in all that thou settest thy hand unto. He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people to himself, as he sworn unto thee, if thou keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. All the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open to thee his good treasure, the heaven to give rain to thy land in its season, to bless all the work of thy hands. Thou shalt lend unto many nations, and shall not borrow. The Lord shall make thee 
the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only and not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which shall command thee this day to observe them and to do them, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods and serve them. And then if you want to read what happens if you go after the gods, read the rest of Deuteronomy 28. It's pretty scary stuff where you'll be besieged and people will be even eating their children. It's time. We're closer now to this becoming a reality than ever before. We can do what we're supposed to do here on the property without the two streams. It's impossible. And I'm not raising money for it. And I'm not borrowing one dollar. Not doing it. Somebody said, then you're going to look like a fool. That's fine. That's fine. I'm not really worried. I've been called everything under the sun. It doesn't really matter. We're going to dig a ditch. God's going to fill it. And everything's going to be done supernaturally. And when it's all said and done, it's all God. It's all God. It's all the Lord. It's not us. It's him. Because already everything's a miracle. We came here with $300 30 years ago. Four suitcases, three children, $300. That's it. And now 60 countries of the world. It's all a miracle. On television around the world, don't pay a dollar. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Other people are paying millions of dollars a month. We didn't pay anything. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's all a miracle. Everything's a miracle. I've got pastors that want to argue with me that I'm believing a hundredfold return. I believe in it. I believe in the hundredfold return. So we're bringing people from survival to revival. And then into the fullness of the destiny of which God has purposed for every single one of your life. And you're going to do what we can't. You'll go where we can't. Your voice will be heard where ours cannot be. Everyone's needed. In the state of Arizona, every year people die. Because people go walking up a canyon and the sky is blue, there's not a cloud in the sky. But they don't know 50 miles away there's, a, there's a been rain, there's a flash flood. And they've been walking along. And around the canyon wall comes a 10 foot high stream of water that just takes them to their death. They didn't know, it didn't look like there was rain, there was no storm, nothing. They're walking in the desert, in a dry place. The Lord said to me, he's going to come suddenly. You, you feel like you're walking in this desert, cactus sticking you in the behind, <laughs> rattlesnake, sound of the rattlesnake, and then suddenly around the canyon wall comes. Yeah. Boom! Yeah. <laughs> you... Better get ready. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. 
Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord 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 Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Well, this is, this is just too much. I can't handle any more. I'm about to run around the room three times here today. <laughs> this is just overwhelming. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want everybody to bow your heads, please, if you would, for a few moments. While the heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you come to this place, you fit into any one of these three categories, I want to pray with you and for you. Maybe you came to this place. You've never given your life to the Lord, never said, Jesus, come be my Lord and Savior. We mentioned eternity today. What would happen if today was your last day on the earth? What would happen if you went home, put your head on your pillow in the middle of the night, you breathed your last breath, where would you go? Where would you spend eternity? I want you to know there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. You don't have to go to a devil's hell because 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross, the price was paid, the blood was shed, and just like that old song said, there is a fountain filled with blood. Drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath their flood, lose all the guilty stain today. The power of sin will be broken off of you. The power of guilt and shame will be removed from your life. And you'll leave this place changed, not by the hand of man, but by the hand of the Lord. That today Jesus is standing with arms wide open and says, come. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I want to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. He calls you. Will you surrender to him? Will you say, Jesus, come. I come just as I am, and I humble myself to receive today. He loves you. That's why he came, and that's why he died. Maybe you gave your life to the Lord in days gone by, but you've grown cold. You're not serving God like you should. There was a time when you were radically on fire for God, but something happened. Maybe it's something hidden that no one could see. Pride, unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, anger, lust, the hidden things that come and clog the heart of man. It's like a spiritual hardening of the arteries, spiritual cholesterol that's clogged your heart. You've even had like a stroke and you can't even worship God. But today, God's going to give you a new heart. He said, I will take out the stony heart and put it in the heart of flesh. He said, a new spirit will I put within you. Will you let him do that? Maybe it's not hidden. Maybe it's outward, something that everybody can see and people remind you of the actual event of when it took place and the devil used it against you now to keep you in a place of guilt and condemnation. You feel like God will never use you because of things that have happened in your life and days gone by. But I want you to know the devil's a liar. God is a God of a second chance and a new beginning. If today you surrender your life afresh to him and say, come, Lord, he will come. He loves you. He stands with arms wide open, says, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He says, Come. Will you surrender to him? Maybe it's not hidden or outward as we describe. Maybe it's a storm that came against your life, a sudden divorce, a bankruptcy, the loss of a loved one, a sudden illness, the betrayal of a close friend, the loss of a job. Something happened that rocked your world, that took your breath away. As Acts 3 and 19 says, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, that the times of refreshing, of recovering from the effects of the heat, of reviving with fresh air will come from the presence of the Lord. He calls you today. Will you surrender to him? He loves you. And then maybe it's not as we described. Maybe the third thing is you love the Lord, there's not even a question, but you're not sure of your salvation. The devil's always lying to you, telling you that you're not saved, but today you want to know that you know that you know that you're a child of God. If this is you, right where you are, without any hesitation whatsoever, I want to pray with you and for you, right where you are, quickly just put your hand up right now. Say, pray for me. I need Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Raise up high. God bless you. 
keep it up high so I can see it. God bless you. 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 God bless you over here. It's right up high. God bless you at the back. God bless you over here. Just God bless you back there. God bless you. 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 Yes, God bless you. 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 Yes, God bless you. 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 Today is your day of freedom and liberty. Today is your day of liberty. Once you raise it, you can put it down. I want you to look at me now, please. Look at me. In this section here, if you didn't raise your hand, but you want to be included in the prayer, we're going to pray right now. Quickly, put your hand up and say, include me. Include me. Don't leave me out. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Right over that side. This section underneath the overhang. God bless you. Yes, yes. Anybody else right on that side? Right at the back there. Right at the back. Anybody else? Right at the back there. Anybody else? This section, you didn't raise your hand. I see your hand right at the back. By the sound booth. Anybody else? Slip it up behind. Another hand there. Anybody else? God bless you. Right over under the overhang this side. Anybody else? Another hand over this side. This section here. You didn't raise your hand but want to be included. Put your hand up. Right at the back. Right at the back. Another hand. Another hand. Okay. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. I want to have the privilege of praying with you and for you. I want to ask every person that raised your hand, if you would stand to your feet right now. Stand up on your feet quickly. Everyone that raised your hand all across the building, stand, 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 stand up right now. Come, come from where you are and come fill up the altar. Come, come now, come, come. We're going to pray. Come on down. We're going to pray right now. Today. Today is your day. Today is your day of freedom. Today is your day. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about a relationship. Come now. Come now. He calls you. 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 Come on. Come on, Tampa. Come on, Tampa. Come on, Tampa. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Those watching my television, as I pray with them, you pray with us. If you mean busy with God, God means busy with you today. I want you to close your eyes and raise your right hand to heaven. That's where your help comes from. And just believe it in your heart and say with your mouth, say this out loud, say, Father, I come to you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Lord, you said in your word, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And I believe in my heart that God has raised you from the dead. I will be saved. And so, Father, right now, I confess Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart right now. Take out the stony heart. Put in a heart of flesh. Wash me. Cleanse me. Change me. Fill me. Use me. Let me never be the same again. I turn my back on the world. I turn my back on sin. And I follow you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. 
Thank you that on the third day you rose from me. And thank you that you're coming back again for me. From this day on, I'll never be the same again. I confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He is my Lord and my Savior. And right now, by faith in the finished work of the cross and by the shed blood of Jesus, I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me now. Now lift both hands and just thank him right now. Father, I pray that you would come and you would seal them now by your blood and by your spirit that on that day not one would be missing. Raise them up to be mighty men and women of God and use them to impact this generation, we pray, for the remainder of their days. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want you to look at me right now. We have a gift for you, but before we, I, I take you through, let me just say this. If there's anybody here, you feel a call of God in your life, we have two schools, River Bible Institute, River School of Worship, and we're giving scholarships away. If you would love to take that challenge, and you'd like that, wave your hand at me. All right, so they'll tell you all about that. It's important that people get trained. Somebody said, I'm too old. If you're under 120, you just write so you'll fit the thing. <laughs> Because remember, it's going to take people of different ages to reach different groups of people. We have people in their 80s that God's using them in a powerful way. So, you know, as long as you're alive and breathing, you can be used for the Lord. Are you with me? Yes. Amen. Thank you for watching today on YouTube. Please press the subscribe button and also the notification button and like and get the word out so others can watch.